Oh my. Hey everybody. Welcome. Hi there. Hey. Well, give people Hi, just a few more minutes and then we'll get the show on the road. Dini, thanks for your nice message about the All Hallows Guild uh, coverage in the Northwest. Oh, DC. yeah. But we just did a, um, an FLO Friday and we did it in the Shadow House on the Cathedral grounds. Wonderful. So we also gave All Hallows Guild a shout out for that. So, super. <laughs> well, uh, hello, everybody. It is just great to see everyone from all over. I've been telling uh, Sarah that we have a uh, representation and virtually from coast to coast. It is just uh, always good to get together with the Olmstead Network and to share best practices and to catch up on Olmstead 200. And we're going to do a little bit of all of that today. Uh, but we're going to start out with our special guest, uh, Sarah Cedar Miller, who was for many years the official photographer and the historian for the Central Park Conservancy. And I, I went to my bookshelf and I found some of my books that I already have from Sarah the Seeing Central Park, Strawberry Fields. I mean, this is just only a, a tiny bit of her uh, wonderful works and how excited we are uh, to have her uh, join us today to give us just a little taste of her upcoming book, Before Central Park. We've all been wanting to know, well, what was there before Central Park? And so here is Sarah to uh, give us some insights. This book will come out from Columbia University Press. Uh, we'll see. We're not sure what that date will be, uh, but it will be soon. And obviously, we're pleased that it will be one of a number of books coming out during the bicentennial year, uh, allowing us to know more about uh, not only Frederick Law Olmsted, but also the spaces where Olmsted operated. And uh, we will on the uh, Olmsted website shortly be posting a piece on the blog that looks at a wide array of books coming out or that have just been released before Central Park is one of them. And so I urge you to take a look at that um, probably sometime next week after we have posted it. But I just wanna say it's great to see Sarah here. Uh, it's a delight to have you Sarah Cedar to join us uh, today and to, um, to inform us about your research and uh, get us excited to go out and purchase before Central Park. So with that, I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Dee Dee. Uh, it's an honor to uh, meet all of you and to um, just give you the slightest uh, taste of a, what is basically a 250 year history in 15 minutes. Um, the project uh, began uh, way back in the 1990s when I worked with the archeologists on doing the upper park. And I saw a new side of Central Park. At that point, I had been there for six years that I had never really uh, understood or even thought about before. And also the other impetus was the fact that when people would take tours with me, I'd say just before we started, are there any questions? And everyone would say, yes, what was this before it was a park? And so I thought, better answer that question. So uh, here we go. Um, well, it's, uh, I've already skipped. Uh, the uh, Most people who have read about Central Park know that it was rocky and it was swampy and it had, um, so was Manhattan. Manhattan means island of hills. So there were, you know, wasn't a very beautiful place to think about putting a, a park in the 19th century. However, a lot of the park, the west side and the part that is in Harlem, basically up at the north end, was nice. And that's where the um, whole uh, settlement began. In fact, the earliest uh, Walloons and Huguenots who came mm -hmm. over with the Dutch settled right about 110th Street. It's not exactly sure where, but we do know exactly from documents what their compound looked like. And there's a wonderful man named Len Tintillo, who's an arch ar artist and a historian and does um, 
representations based on information of what this compound would have looked like. And this is fairly accurate in terms of from all the written description that we have. They were Johannes de la Montaigne and Hendrik de Forest who died soon after and Johannes de la Montaigne took over and um, he was a doctor and he, his um, brother-in-law Henrik died. And so he moved up to basically the north end of Central Park, right up against the agricultural fields that the Native American Lenape had already cleared. Um, somehow there was some easy transition of power between and deed between the Lenape, uh, nothing written, but also no conflict. And um, the uh, family did a tobacco bowery. Uh, at that point um, and, and did quite well in the first year. Uh, so now, um, well, let's see, I keep skipping. So here you can see Central Park and these were Native American trails up to, this is about 124th Street and the East River. Down here is Central Park and there was a Native American trail that became later the, um, uh, Kingsbridge Road once the English took over and at this spot in the park which doesn't look like a very different part of the park than any other is actually one of the most historic spots in all of Manhattan Island and it's where um, because the road went through a narrow uh, rock outcrops that um, it was the only, it was the major highway in and out of Manhattan. And so much happened there, particularly military history and um, tavern and taverns and families moved there. Uh, the Benson family and the McGowan family were a big family that had a tavern, a major tavern. And we'll just jump over to 1776 when one of the most, um, to me, most fascinating and earliest things that I discovered was the fact that George Washington, unbeknownst to most historians, George Washington had a major council of war meeting with his generals in this building in Central Park that changed the whole nature of the Revolutionary War in New York City. So um, it, it, um, lots more about it and uh, what happened to the family and who lived there during the war, a lot of Hessian soldiers and a lot of activity, but I don't have time to tell you. <laughs> Today, that historic spot is, of course, it, this is a pretty picture of the composting operation in Central Park, and it's kind of off the beaten path. Lots of people don't even know it exists, but it's really important to our operation horticulturally. Um, it's what makes Central Park green. So, uh, you know, it's an important part, uh, but it, this spot, this area of Central Park had um, the Revolutionary War sites and also the War of 1812. Here are, is uh, drawings from the McGowan's Pass, that little path you saw, um, while there was a gatehouse and fortifications. And one of the fun things that my research turned up is the butcher's apprentices who built this ramparts. And it's a wonderful first person account in a man, Daniel Burtnick, his later in life, he was um, not, an, a, not a butcher, but as a young teenager, he and his colleagues built this wall and this ramparts and it's you know kind of fun. It's actually really sweet story. Um, part of it is also um, the existing blockhouse that became a powder magazine where gunpowder was st stored. And there's a whole story about who owned it and where the gunpowder went. Part of it was used to blast Central Park when it was in construction. This skips every other thing. Anyway, Today, yesterday, there is a blog on the Columbia University Press site about a woman who was enslaved by that McGowan Benson family. And it's a very long story, but it's a story that you can read the whole thing um, on the site. I'm sure there's a link to it, or we can send you a link. And um, 
it was this small strip of land here between 109th and 110th Street that through a real estate deal actually manumitted a slave through possibly the only instance in all of New York City where a slave was manumitted an enslaved person was manumitted through a real estate deal, which encompassed maybe only the perimeter of 109th to 110th Street and Duke Ellington, what is now Duke Ellington Circle. But it's a, um, it was so much fun to figure that out. So I encourage you to read the blog. You can read it today. Now, the part that most people are unfamiliar with are are familiar with in Central Park is what was known as the common lands. It's the rocky, swampy middle of Manhattan Island. It went all the way down to 23rd Street and up to, up to 93rd Street. And uh, so um, this road, I don't know, am I pointing? Oh yes, I am pointing. Um, this whole area was part of Central Park up here too. And this is Fifth, what became Fifth Avenue and here's 93rd Street. And a lot of this was rocky and swampy and it was owned by the city of New York. It was owned by New Amsterdam and long before that. And um, nobody wanted it and it wasn't very well developed. But after the revolution, the city needed money. It had no money, it was bankrupted practically. And so it sold off their rocky swampy land to buyers and had it developed into these five acre plots. It looks like the grid of Manhattan, but the plots were much bigger. They were five acres. And several people bought and stayed from about 1800 all the way until they took the land for the park. The, the Amory family and the Wagstaff family created farms that are some of the most important landscapes in Central Park. The mall, Bethesda Terrace, the East Green, um, the Rumsey Playfield, and uh, the Cedar Hill, even possibly a part of the Metropolitan Museum of Art over in this area was, um, and then this is James Amory's farm. Here's the mall is going right up uh, 6th Avenue. This is his farm, a little bit of Sheep Meadow. So um, there's a lot on the family. They're both very interesting families and um, we don't have time to talk about them. <laughs> so uh, in 1825, the Erie Canal came to New York City and Overnight, it made New York City very prosperous and people started, all the old families started buying and selling land and selling off and dividing their land. Uh, in Bloomingdale, uh, the most famous area that was divided was Seneca Village that was divided by a man named John Whitehead. He was a cart man and a wealthy one and um, much about him in the book but uh, he divided the land and sold it to um, African-Americans and it became, I think most of you have probably heard of it by now, um, the largest um, African-American property owning land in probably the um, United States if there were America at that point. It has a long rich history. Many people live there. Many people did not who owned the land, some rented. It was a constantly, um, the, the, article in my research has revealed how much land was bought and sold mostly by African Americans to African Americans over the course of history. It wasn't, it wasn't um, as well, we didn't know, but it turns out to have been um, a lot of um, prosper, pros, prosperous real estate deals for um, an empowerment for Black Americans who were um, trying to vote. And of course, only black males with $250 of worth assessed property could vote. Um, there's a lot in it in the book and even how much everybody, everybody in the park was paid, but that's towards the end of the book. And we don't have time to talk about all this important stuff. At the other end of the park, uh, starting in 1848, uh, the Sisters of Charity of Mount St. Vincent. This is the composting area you're looking at. Mm -hmm. And also somewhere in here, um, 
the McGowan Benson family farm. So it they the, they sold it to the sisters and the sisters stayed even after the park started construction till 1859 they are still in existence but it, there were 200 catholic school girls and sisters um living working uh and um having a religious community of novitiates up until 1859 they moved to um yonkers uh new york border where they still are today. And uh, down where Conservatory Garden is, right in the lawn was a Jewish cemetery. There were other cemeteries in the park. So towards the 1840s, you couldn't have a cemetery in the lower park. It was forbidden. And so a lot of this was still far out of town. And a lot of um, congregations and churches were looking at land up in inside Central Park. Uh, also, uh, in the water system in New York was really bad. And long story short, the receiving reservoir, which is now the Great Lawn, started they thought it would last for decades. And of course, eight years later, New Yorkers had used all the water and they were abusing uh, the environment as um, we could expect. They were so happy to have water that they left their taps running all winter so their pipes wouldn't freeze. And uh, bingo, eight years later, they knew they needed another reservoir. And of course, we know where they put it to the reservoir that still exists today. Um, the whole story of immigration in the late mid 1840s till 1850s, uh, people moved onto the land. This is actually somewhere around the lake or on the lake. You can see um, this would be like considered a one and a half story house, but you can see the outhouse. You can see their kitchen garden and a, all it's winter. So when this photograph was taken, but you could see that they had planted an orchard. There's lots of rocks still. And here are glacial erratics all over the landscape. But um, I've never found out who lives in this house. It doesn't exist on maps. It makes me crazy. But um, we know it was actually <laughs> a house photographed in the park because you can see other, other things. Anyway, um, immigration had a huge um, impact on the park and on the city of New York. And for social reform reasons and health reasons, New York City decided that they needed a park. And that's part three of the book takes up the, this is a part many of you are probably familiar with, but there was a big fight on where the park should be. And then they knew they were taking this rocky swampy land who that was much cheaper and also had the future reservoir right here. So it went out, it's you know a story that was well told in the park and the people. And um, I have some other additional information on it, but uh, so they took it and it became a, a park in 1853. They took the land, the state legislature in July 21st, 1853. And um, then what's next ah then they decided that someone had to run it and there was a big political issue and the mayor of new york fernando wood the most corrupt mayor that probably new york has ever seen um took over decided he was the park new park commissioner with his street commissioner they hired egbert vile on the left and um we probably know a lot about him because he and Olmsted, who he hired, who he didn't hire, but the new Republican uh, state legislature or board of commissioners hired them. The two of them spent 1857 uh, constructing, deconstructing, building, not building, draining the park. Um, it's the story that most of you, of course, know. Um, but Olmsted, as superintendent, probably had no idea that he would eventually become the landscape architect until Calvert Fox walked into his life. Most of you, Calvert Fox, a British trained young architect, uh, came to America. Andrew Jackson Downing drowned in the Hudson River. He moved to New York. And um, he and Downing had been designing what was supposed to be the first public park in America, the mall in Washington. 
and in fact, the Smithsonian grounds and an urn dedicated to Downing on the mall right in the Smithsonian, original Smithsonian grounds was designed, the urn to Downing was designed by Calvert Fox. And um, it's now in the Hoped, I think, Hoped Garden. Anyway, Vox had met da um, Olmsted at Downing's uh, residence in Newburgh once. And Vox was very smart. He hated VLA's plan for the park, which had been adopted and convinced the board of commissioners to hold a design competition. He did not like working alone. And so he invited Frederick Law Olmsted to be his partner. And Olmsted, you know, we know the end result, they won the prize to design the park, but initially Olmsted turned Vox down. So if it weren't for Calvert Vox, who was very persistent, and we know that from the letters back and forth and for Prospect Park, that Vox could get into Olmsted and really drive him crazy until he did what he wanted him to do. And so Vox, who didn't want to step on Vile's toes, went to Vile and said, would you please let me, you know, enter the competition? And Vile said, you know, go ahead, who cares? You know, never dreaming, of course, that he would win. And so here, of course, is the Greensward plan, beautifully recently restored and now at the Municipal Archives of the City of New York. And I'm just showing you a Greensward from Central Park and a beautiful woodland. Uh, here is the formal mall that used to be James Amory's farm. And I just do not speak about Central Park without reminding everyone that without the Central Park Conservancy, the park would not look as beautiful and be as well managed as it is today. Here is the original land that the um, Johannes de la Montaigne back in 1637 moved into and uh, the whole beautiful landscape. And we're now doing a huge addition of the pool and rink and outdoor center. And I hope I did it under 15 minutes. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Sarah. I know that it is a cruel and unusual punishment to restrict you to 15 minutes to be talking about uh, before Central Park, but we want to just entice our crowd here and uh, give us all reason to run out and pre-purchase. And obviously there'll be uh, many future discussions because there is so much to discuss as you've outlined. I would, I think we have a few minutes if we can, if there are one or two questions, uh, we'll take one or two and then we'll move on our agenda. Otherwise we can have you come back and take questions later if we've, if um, if we don't get any uh, today, but it uh, clearly is just fascinating, and um, uh, no wonder you're breathless because who wouldn't be trying to cover so much um, in in such a constricted time frame? So, so I think what we'll do is we'll set you free, but we really appreciate your sharing with us. Um, your new book, we're looking forward to it, and we will continue the conversation about this uh, important history. I know Sarah and I were talking before um, this uh, gathering, and I think just thinking about the history of all of our parks. Uh, what was it before um, your park? I think it's a very, very interesting uh, and important uh, conversation and research topic. So Sarah, thank you for giving us the, uh, the first template for how to, to, how to go about doing it, so. It was my pleasure and fun. I had the fun. Yeah, thanks so much. Well, we'll do, what we'll do is we'll go from the sublime to, I wouldn't say the ridiculous, but we will certainly go to uh, some detailed work right now. I just wanted to uh, bring everybody up to date on a few developments in our Olmsted 200 planning and want to thank all of you uh, on this call because I know you all are working very hard to pull things together in anticipation of April and the entire celebration year. It was great to see the Greensward plan and I want to say thank you on this call to the Municipal Archives which will be doing a pop-up 
opportunity to see the original Greensward plan uh, in the weekend prior to the birthday. So that's just one of many exciting activities underway and we're really looking forward to that and wanna thank the Municipal Archives for making that possible. As you can see, we have announced the winners of the Carillon competition. This was a competition that was announced in 20. 21 and uh, we figured that no matter whether we had a, a pandemic or not that there would be carillons which could play works inspired by Olmsted and so we have a wonderful new booklet of music that we've sent out to carillon players across the country there will be a concert at Riverside Church immediately uh, adjoining Riverside Park on the birthday at 12 noon uh, so for those of you who are in New York City, you will be able to hear these new pieces debuted there. And we have a jury working as we speak on an analysis of various student essays which have come in, uh, asked to analyze the how Olmsted's ideas can apply to current challenges. We look forward to seeing what they've come up with. And I think as all of you know, uh, NAOP continues to hold regional meetings across the country with uh, Olmsted rich areas as we aim to create coordinated and consolidated calendars in the Milwaukee, Chicago area, Atlanta, Boston, New York, um, Chicago and other locations. We also sent out online this week uh, the first online invitation reminder you will receive uh, about attending our gala dinner at uh, Central Park at the Loeb Boathouse with thanks to the Central Park Conservancy uh, for partnering with us on this. We're very, very excited and uh, hope that we will see all or at least some, if not all of you there. We will be sending that invitation out again. If you would like to receive it, just put a note in the chat box and we'll make certain that you have it. We are hoping that conservancies across the country will think about having a table. Uh, and we have heard from many uh, who are interested in doing so. We're also gonna go to Chicago in June where we will be dining at the Glessner House designed by Henry Hobson Richardson. And it is a place where Olmsted stayed when he was working at the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition. We'll be doing tours of Chicago parks and also attending a Carillon concert at the University of Chicago, right there on the Midway Plaisance. So if you have questions, uh, please feel free to email me at any time. As I say, we really hope to see people here. We're really looking forward to uh, taking the eve of the birthday and celebrating the life work and more importantly, the values which live on and the places that all of you oversee uh, with such diligence and care. Uh, with that, I'll open it up to any questions and then we'll turn it over to Victoria. All right, I see a question. Will the carillon music be available for electronic carillons? I regret to say it will not. I believe for our music to be played, it has to be at least 47 bells. And so uh, unless there's something made in the future for electric car uh, carillons, it will not be available for that. Mm -hmm. But we will have a calendar of concerts on the uh, national calendar. And so you will be able to filter that and see if there are uh, various concerts in your area. Thank you. And I see Brian's got a good advertisement for Landscapes and Legacies, the conference coming up in Boston. There also is an exhibit at the Boston Public Library that will be looking at public landscapes over many years. Um, so I encourage people to register for both of those uh, in Boston. Victoria, do you wanna give us an update from your end? Sure. Um, as always, I just wanna highlight some important links that we have here for you in the agenda. Um, we're really coming down to the wire for April. Um, so we are really encourage you to submit your events. Our calendar is growing exponentially every day and we really want to feature everything that's happening across um, the country and, and even farther than that. So 
please use that link there to submit your events. And also remember that we have resources available for you. We have a lot of partner resources um, linked here, but also if you want to connect with me, I have you know, social media copy, other, other types of collateral that I can share with you. We also have our advocacy toolkit, which includes the FLO Day proclamation and recently updated our press release section on our website, our press kit section, apologies. Um, and it's not linked here, but I'm gonna drop it in the chat. And I hope you guys will go um, look at it. We have a press release template that you can use to talk about your Olmstead 200 events, to talk about any of your Olmstead 200 participation. And we really encourage you to, to connect with us um, as you're submitting these press releases so that we can connect with our media team and really amplify the Olmsted 200 message. We are still working on securing a Google Doodle. Um, we've seen a lot of good positive um, feedback come through. A lot of particularly um, conservancy members and ASLA members are submitting to Google asking for a Google Doodle. So we encourage you to not only um, join us in submitting a, a request, but share it with your networks and try to get them to submit to Google as well. We really feel like the bigger the fuss we can make, the more likely it is that we'll see FLO on April 26th on the Google homepage. And then probably most importantly, um, our call for field notes is out. We would really like your kind of internal news so if you have something to share with us for NAOP's, you know, uh, twice a year e-newsletter, please, please do share that with me. You can send it directly to my email or send it to us at our info at naop.org email. Um, and we will get that in our April field notes edition. But we're asking that everyone submit by the end of February. So we're looking at March 1st as a deadline. The way those are gonna work, just for your information, is everything's gonna go up on the Olmsted 200 blog. So when you do submit it, kind of keep that in mind. We're looking for about 500 to 800 words, and we're looking for horizontal photos. So you're gonna kind of get a double hitter there, a little bit of, you know, uh, a little bit of Olmsted 200 action, and then it's gonna go out through NAOP as well. And just this morning, we had a FLO Friday Instagram Live with Olmsted Parks Conservancy. We thought it went great, despite a little bit of wind. Um, but it is available on our Instagram page, and we really encourage you to check it out. It was a lovely conversation uh, between Dee Dee and Layla George. And we, th we thank you both for, for doing it. It was, it was a really great discussion. And of course, we have our link tree if you're looking for anything um, from our YouTube channel to, to shared spaces. The recent conversations with Olmstead is listed there and the recent Olmstead Insider is linked there as well. I think that's it for me, Dee Dee. Terrific, always lots going on. Thank you, Victoria. Do we have any questions for Victoria? Certainly feel free to put them in the, uh, in the chat. Let's see, let me look at, I see Jen has a question. Let me go back to that. Um, Didi, what I'll do, Jen, mm -hmm. I can link our information there for you and you can kind of dig through it. Um, we have an Eventbrite set up and, and we have information on our website. Great, great. Wonderful, all right. Yes, I should say, I mean, there's a question about the April 26th event. We, we will have the uh, evening gala. There will be a special lecture on Olmsted and the Civil War that will be at the New York Historical Society. We're anticipating a number of tours will be available. As I say, the pop-up for the municipal archives on the weekend prior, uh, the Carillon concert and other things that are in play. I was uh, uh, very lucky to chat yesterday with some of the New York City Parks representatives, thanks to um, Prospect Park. And they are working on an exhibit that will be in the arsenal and that will be open and available for everyone. And so we will be putting together a composite of all the activities in New York City and New York State, of which we are aware uh, throughout the year. And I can say it's a very nice 
uh, listing. And as I indicated, we're really trying to do that in all of the cities in which there we have uh, Olmstead rich areas uh, because it makes it a lot easier for us to pitch uh, the celebration by being able to show the diverse array of activities and organizations involved in Olmstead 200. Uh, we want to just do a shout out also, we've, we've written it down, but we want to do a shout out to Sue Donahue. We're so excited that she's going to take over the New York City Parks Department. And then Dan from Riverside has also uh, gotten a wonderful job with New York City planning. So it's nice to see uh, our network so beautifully represented now in the city um, amongst city officials. Uh, we just want to say uh, congratulations to both of them. And then uh, before I open it up to the field, just a quick update on proclamations. I know the thanks to uh, Niagara Falls and Angela Berti uh, with the state park that a request for a proclamation has gone into Governor Hochul. So I know that is in the works and uh, that I know Staten Island has uh, made progress on one for uh, the island and that a number of us are in conversation about a mayoral proclamation. But we are certainly encouraging everyone uh, to reach out to local officials, whether it's your mayor or your governor, uh, to obtain an FLO Day proclamation uh, in honor of the bicentennial. And I wanted to thank everyone who participated in our informal poll on endowments. Uh, here is what we were able to find out. And we've gotten some additional supplemental information since that time. This will be something going forward that uh, NAOP uh, will be working on diligently. Uh, we really want to be able to survey the members of our Olmstead network across the country so that we can accumulate this kind of information uh, about you uh, because we know that we frequently receive inquiries from you. In fact, this came from um, a friends group in New Jersey that was very interested in finding this out. So one of our uh, long-term goals is to be the definitive repository of this kind of information. We've also gotten a request, for instance, of how many Olmstead parks have rivers in them. So these are the sorts of queries that we'll be undertaking uh, as we move forward. At this point, though, I just wanted to open it up to the group. If you want to uh, raise your hand, uh, we'll just, uh, we'd love for any updates, questions, things that you need, any, any way that we can help. Um, we're here to hear it. So do we have any questions at this point? I have a question, yeah, Leila. Leila. Hi, um, I would love to know if anybody has worked with a strategic uh, planning consultant that you would recommend. We're looking at a few different local companies here in Kentucky, but also curious if there are any strategic planners that specialize in parks or park systems. So feel free to just message me or send an email to me or via Didi if there's anyone um, that you think we should consider. Thank you. Fantastic. I'm lucky I get to see Layla twice in one day. <laughs> Other questions? Matters for the group? Ah, oh, this is group is rarely so quiet. I can't believe it. I see Marlene has a hand up. Okay, let's see, Marlene. I forgot to lower my hand before. I'm oh, sorry. I, all right, but I see thank Jen. You. How about Jen? Jen's got her hand up. Yeah, I just I um I wanted to thank you for sharing more about the the gala in New York, and I know that there was more info to come on the April 26th activities in Central yes. Park. Yeah. Um, I, a few folks on the call, I see Lauren, uh, Brianne, folks from NPS, um, we're trying to um, host a, um, you know, a, a celebration of the birthday at, at sunset time um, here in Boston for um, Mr. Olmstead and, uh, you know, 
we're curious if other folks were doing other things at, at set times of day or things like that, if there were a way to point people to activities. We're, we're hoping to be live and outdoors <laughs> um, mm -hmm. at that point, but um, if any other folks have activities going on that um, are happening on the day itself, just curious if anybody wanted to share in the chat or, or on the call. And Jen, one other thing you can do is you can filter um, on the calendar now. And so you will be able to see a number of April 26 activities. I know Druid Hills has got something planned. I can't, at, at this moment, I can't remember what time, but if you just filter for the day, you'll be able to see what's been listed so far. Do we have any answers for, for Jan? Um, Michael, I see your hand. Yes, hi, this is just a separate question if there were answers first to that, but um, this is Michael from the Chicago Parks Foundation. And I just wanted to share that we're doing some planning ahead for our spring events and programs. And two things that we're working on for the spring are a new item for us, which is a print magazine we're going to be doing for our list um, featuring different stories about the parks and donors and partners. And a recurring section we'd like to have in that magazine is a parks history section. Um, so we'd love for that feature in this first edition that we're looking to get out in May to be about Olmstead, all about Olmstead, not just you know the ties to Chicago, but the larger story. And then another thing happening around the same time, ideally in May, is for our membership program of donors who are members. Um, looking to put together some events for them. Perhaps in May, they would still start out as just something like a Zoom lecture about a certain topic, but same thing there. We'd love for that topic to be about Olmstead to kind of preview um, the rest of the summer events coming up. And again, just kind of tell the whole story of the history. So just wanted to put that out there. And Dee Dee and Victoria, I was gonna follow up with you after this about specific details of um, who we might want to involve with that, but we'd love to get kind of some guest speakers slash writers um, for those two things on our end. Great. Yes, we'd be happy to help. So let's uh, chat after the after the meeting. Great. Thanks. Super. All right, let's see. Brad. Oh, hi, Didi. Hi, everyone. It's, it's great to be here. Um, yeah, we, uh, Morningside has Lots of fun things, and Dee Dee and I have talked about some of those uh, that'll be happening on the 26th. And I'm sorry I, I, I wasn't at the meeting yesterday with the New York. I didn't realize that was happening, but um, we're going to do a walking tour uh, on the morning of the 26th. And, you know, it should be good timing. Uh, it'll wrap up before the Carillon uh, concert. So that should be fun. People can just head over to Riverside to hear that. Um, and we're still hoping to get some local school kids out. Um, we have an amazing uh, Reclining Liberty uh, sculpture in the park and sort of, sort of discussion about Olmstead and, 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 and art and Reclining Liberty. Um, I've also reached out to Sarah uh, Zodi. Is that her name? She's on mm -hmm. the honorary committee. Mm -hmm. And uh, she, she's also a Harlem resident. So uh, she and I are, are gonna be discussing uh, additional plans for the 26th. Fantastic. And then, and then we have a, a fundraiser ourselves. I mean, our organization uh, is is celebrating its 40th anniversary. So, we've got 200, we've got 40, we've got all these big anniversaries, <laughs> and and we're just going to have a, a big party on on the evening of the 26th. Fantastic! Great, yeah. Brad. Thanks. Wonderful news. Oh, who have I missed? Let's see. Who else? All right. Well, and Brad referenced, oh, and I think we mentioned this before, we are uh, working on a, an eight and a half foot Frederick Law Olmstead. It's called a big head. Uh, if any of you follow the Washington National Baseball, they have the racing presidents. Well, this will be the racing Frederick Law Olmstead. So we're working on it. It's made by a, a puppeteer actually based in New York City. And this is something that we hope will be available 
uh, to multiple parks. So we'll obviously we'll start out in New York City. Uh, it is a 50 pound head. So it is um, necessary to transport the head uh, from one park to another, but it does fit on a human being and uh, it will be a, a gigantic rendition of the expressionistic head that is on the Olmsted 200 website. You all know the charming little figure that um, decorates many of our items. This will be an, an eight and a half foot rendition of that. So we'll keep you posted on that, but it is even possible to ship it. Um, and so uh, for other parks outside of the New York area, this is a possibility. And so we'll keep you posted on that as well. Now, Ayo, you've got your hands up. Welcome, good to see you. Hi, everybody. Um, Ayo here from Detroit Belle Isle Conservancy. I uh, just wanna share, we are celebrating our 10 year anniversary this year. So we might be the baby of the group, but um, we're really happy to be celebrating. Um, so there'll be a number of things happening, some virtually. Um, and if you happen to be in Detroit in April around Earth Week, we have actually we're doing a couple of things. We usually do a major cleanup effort on the island as a way to kick off kind of the summer season. Um, but we also are doing um, adding this year an art exhibition. So um, if there are actually any artists in your network who might be interested or have connections to Belle Isle, um, we are doing art of all forms and mediums. Um, and we'll do an installation actually inside of the Belle Isle Aquarium that will be up um, for people to come and enjoy as they um, visit the aquarium, but also support our efforts throughout the weekend. Um, so, and it'll, it'll remain up for, um, post that is uh, post the weekend as well and trying to think of anything else that might be important um that's the most exciting thing i think if you're just curious about what's happening with the conservancy and on bell isle uh, we have the state of the conservancy which will be held on march 24th at 6 p.m and you'll be able to access that um, via youtube and so those are some of our events um, if you're in detroit let us know we'd love to have you on the island well, that's terrific. And I see Victoria has just put something in the chat and I want to uh, emphasize it. These stories about the anniversaries that your own conservancies are having would make wonderful blog posts, both in field notes and on uh, the Olmsted 200 shared spaces. So Brad and Io, I know that the uh, Arnold Arboretum is uh, celebrating its 150th. We would love to showcase uh, your conservancy and your friends group and its its planned celebration as well. So uh, 500 to 800 words would be great and uh, submit it to Victoria and then we can uh, get the word out because we really would like to celebrate your anniversaries as well. And please put anything you can in the calendar. It doesn't have to be virtual. We are hoping to uh, persuade people to go from coast to coast throughout 2022. So I, we want everyone to know if they happen to be in Detroit, what they can visit while they're there. So great. Kate. Uh, I'm, on mute. I, oh, I'm not on mute. Hi, uh, thank you for calling on me. Um, as you're traversing from coast to coast, uh, please consider on the 27th of April to stop in uh, in the Denver Mountain Parks. Uh, Lawrence Cotton will be doing a lecture um, at the Chief Hosa Lodge in Genesee Park. Um, so you can stop and see the, the bison herd there as well as tour the Denver Mountain Parks. And then on June 4th, we have Tommy Matthews, who is uh, with Tribal Architects. He did the um, architecture uh, series and there was a video that you all posted on your blog tour of the Denver Mountain Parks. He will be doing a driving tour uh, for a full day going from park to park and talking about the Olmsted Junior Design, uh, which we are hoping is going to be a fantastic event. So on your way traversing the coast, please uh, consider stopping in Denver. Kate, that's wonderful. And if we don't have them on the calendar, please put those on the calendar. I do want to highly recommend the blog by Tommy Matthews. It's just a beautiful introduction to Denver Mountain Parks and the rustic buildings in the park with gorgeous photography and a little video. So I recommend that. And I should say we have been in touch with folks in Boulder and also in Colorado Springs, the Broadmoor Resort 
uh, has an Olmstead legacy, and they will be focusing on that and doing some movies and other activities at Broadmoor. And we hope to have a few tours in Boulder as well. So we are working um, in the, all the states that we can to get as many exciting activities as possible. But um, plan your trip to Colorado. Kate's now given you a great, a great reason for it. Good. More, Joanne. Hi, everybody. Um, Joanne Beck from Highland Park Conservancy in Rochester with a developing story. We're not there yet, but um, a referral has been uh, introduced to the Monroe County Legislature to fully fund our signature project, the reconstruction of the Children's Pavilion. The vote is March 8th, so I don't want to jinx it. Um, but we have passed every preliminary threshold to date, and um, it's a big, big deal. Would not have happened without Olmstead 200. So thank you. Joanne, that's just really, really exciting news. And I think we've written for you already, uh, but if there's anything more that NAOP could write or do, we're, we're at your... Uh, Beck and call. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Super. Very good news. All right. More hands. Let's see. Who am I missing? And if you all are not familiar with the Children's Pavilion, uh, take a look on the Highland Park Conservancy. It is so exciting. That will be just a remarkable uh, addition to uh, it, it's a fantastic space. The letters from Olmsted regarding the construction of that, his concerns about health, how he interacted with the donor. It's all just a fascinating story. So we'll have to plan a special trip to Rochester, Joanne, as soon as that's completed. So <laughs> sounds great. Yes. <laughs> great. Anything more for the good of the order? I still see two hands on my guide but i'm not finding you who am i missing uh dd this is robert connors robert hey welcome how are you good it's nice to hear your voice uh, i've really enjoyed the programs i wanted to let everyone know that if they happen to be in the mode to come to florida at any time in this winter season we will be having uh, some uh, observances here in lake wales uh which is of course home to to Olmsted's uh, historic Mountain Lake, amazing Mountain Lake community, the uh, Bach Tower Gardens, the Mountain Lake Sanctuary, and of course, then the, the cityscapes that Olmsted did here, where he actually created the first zoning plan uh, for the city, which is a pretty remarkable thing. And we are in the process of rehabilitating those original landscapes and recognizing the neighborhoods that he designed from whole cloth and we plan a uh, April 30th event um, called Olmstead Day in the Park, which will uh, be an all day family fun gathering with music and food and lots of games and contests for the kids and just a great, de great deal of educational materials. And that will be preceded by a special presentation to our city commission on the, on the actual birth date uh, that evening. Uh, so we're looking forward to, uh, to that and, and making great progress with that rehabilitation of the very extensive landscapes here. Great. Wonderful. Wonderful. Great news. Thank you, Robert. That's wonderful. Any more reports? All right. Well, lots to digest with another thank you to Sarah for her presentation. And thanks to all of you for news of these exciting events. We will be putting together these consolidated calendars. And so we'll have more for you on activities in New York City, as well as activities in Chicago with those two particular uh, events, and then uh, consolidated calendars that uh, you will be able to see in other cities around the country. So with that, we are right at three o'clock. I just wanna say thanks again. We will see everybody next month. It's March, that means 
It's only one more month till birthday. Uh, it's hard to believe, but uh, that's just intended to give you feel a little pressure to get those events on the calendar and uh, let us know how we can help because we're really uh, looking forward to celebrating with you and continuing to explore the legacy of Olmsted's work and values. So everybody have a great weekend and we'll see you in a month. Thanks, Didi. Thanks, everybody. Bye, all. Thanks, see ya.